Good morning. How much fun is it to sit up here and watch you all scramble to find a seat? I know it's not fun for you, but how great that, that the house is full for, for us to celebrate today. It's an interesting day today. For those of you who kind of pay attention to backgrounds of the, the PowerPoint, and I know you don't, but if you do, you, you see like it kind of matches the color of the church here, so purple for Lent. And this morning, it's a little purple and white, because that's kind of what the day is. It's a little purple and a little white. There, there's glory and there's excitement and joy as Jesus is given the praise that he's finally due as the Son of God as he comes into Jerusalem on that last Palm Sunday. And, and yet it's purple. We're still in Lent. We know why he's going into Jerusalem that last time. And, and even that praise and that glory that he's given, it's a little lackluster. It's not really the praise and honor that's due him. It's a little subdued. And so we'll see this contrast between his humble nature in which he comes in and his exaltation too today as we follow Jesus into Jerusalem today on Palm Sunday. And that's our celebration for today. We'll spend our time together as we begin in song. Let's join in singing our opening hymn. I'll invite you to stand. This morning we're going to use the common service today and we'll use our liturgy songs from the common service as well. We'll still speak our amens, but it'll feel a little bit more like we used to worship with the common service. And so we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and he's given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as we're called servants of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you've redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, as he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path. So may we always hail him as our King and follow him with proper confidence, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we turn our attention to the word. Our Old Testament lesson for today, Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. And, and even in our Old Testament lesson, we have this sort of blend of the purple and the white, the, the humility and the humble way in which Jesus comes in as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And yet there is glory that is given him as well. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So far, our Old Testament lesson. In response to the word, let's join together in confessing our faith. We'll use the Nicene Creed today. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. 
and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The epistle lesson for today from, from Philippians chapter 2 speaks to us first of Jesus' willingness to be humbled in our behalf and that when his work was done, he would be glorified as he rightly should be. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by, become, by, by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So far, the word. Our worship continues with our hymn of the day. I'll invite you to stand for the reading of our gospel lesson, which serves as our sermon text for today. God's grace, his mercy and peace are yours in abundance through our Lord, our Savior, the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Amen. We give our attention to Mark chapter 11, the first 11 verses. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you what are you doing or why are you doing this, say the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. And as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to. And the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany 
with the twelve. So far the word. Before we sit, let's offer a prayer. Will you join me in your hearts? Lord Jesus, we see the praise that was offered you on that Sunday. While it wasn't completely fitting, it wasn't the honor that was due you, you found joy in that praise. It is not so different than our praise. Ours isn't always fitting. It's not do you, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and yet we offer it, Lord. Help us to offer our hearts now as we listen to your word and are strengthened and instructed by it. Be with us and let us bring you our praise in this time in your word. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, many of you have been taking this journey with me in our midweek services for the Lenten season. We've been looking at the hands of the passion. And if you know anything or remember anything about this journey that we've been taking of the hands of the passion, you've seen that most of the time when we've looked at the hands of the passion, what we've seen is we've looked at primarily people, not Jesus, whose hands are involved in the passion. And most often, we've found fault with what they've done. And certainly, we can find and we'll see a little fault in the hands of praise that are raised today in this section of Scripture. And yet, it's nice to have a little different flavor on this Palm Sunday. While we're still in Lent, we see that there is glory and honor raised in praise to our Lord Jesus. And so let's journey along with those on that first Palm Sunday and notice the hands of praise that are before us today. As we do that, we might, and you've sort of been teased and coerced into thinking it this whole morning. I'll just go back quickly to the picture, a hand holding a palm, and that's what we're thinking of perhaps as we talk about hands of praise. But honestly, the hands of praise that we see comes in a different form at the beginning of our text, and, and that's where we're, we'll go to, to look for these hands and how they're raised in praise. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead. Right? And he gives them this complicated story of what's going to happen and how they're going to find this animal there. So, so just step back for a second and put yourself in their position. This is the, this is it. This is the holiday. This is the celebration for the Jews. Everybody comes out and heads to Jerusalem for Passover. And so there are crowds upon crowds. There's people everywhere and chaos everywhere. And in the midst of this, Jesus says, go into town ahead of us, you'll find a donkey. Like there's only one. And somehow they're supposed to figure out which donkey Jesus is talking about and just take it and bring it back. And then he tells them, well, and if you find it, and someone might protest, tell them this. That's what happens, right? Verse 4 continues, they went and found a colt outside in the street and tied on a doorway. And as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to and the people let them go. Here are hands of praise for us. First, untying the colt. The disciples willingly listening to Jesus. And then there are hands of accepting that and sending that colt on his way as the people who hear, well, the Lord's going to take it and bring it back. They go, sure, take it. In this crowd, in this chaos, how trusting do you have to be to think that this is coming back? Put yourself in that position for a second. Imagine that I came up to you and said, I'm taking your car. And you know me. Some of you might go, I know him. There's no way I'm giving him my car. Have you seen him drive? That might be your response. Or some of you might go, I know him and, and I trust him, but it's my car. And, and most of us have more than one car. But it's a big deal, isn't it? I'm not borrowing a spoon from you. It's a car. That's what the equivalent of the donkey was. 
Probably their only donkey. Maybe, likely, the thing that they used for their work and to provide for their family or business or whatever it was. This was important, a donkey for them. And us two strangers come up and say, we're taking the donkey. And they let him go. And the disciples, in the chaos of this, and Jesus sends them on this errand that from an earthly perspective you'd think would be impossible. What now, Jesus? We're going to go in the midst of this craziness and all these people into this town and find the donkey you want? And they do it. Hands of obedience that without question simply accept and serve the Lord's will. And when you think about this, you know, from our perspective, when we think of praise, we, we maybe think of Jesus as, you know, when he was praised in his earthly life, it was around worship. But the truth is, that's not how it went. Jesus never went to the temple and people went, yay, the Messiah's here. That didn't happen. Sometimes he went to a synagogue, the, the small little churches where they would study God's word and the, and the little um, outposts and, and cities that are dotted around Israel. He would go there and sometimes they'd let him preach. But even then, most of the time they're going, who's this guy to say this kind of stuff? Most of Jesus' life, he wasn't recognized as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Most of the time, Jesus isn't given praise and honor and glory. The way that Jesus was honored and glorified almost continually in his life was not through the praise of worship, but through the hands of obedience. As his disciples followed him willingly and trustingly and did what he asked. It was in the hands of obedience when, when people came with a need or a concern or an offering and they gave it to Jesus and said, here, use this. Or help us. It was hands of obedience that trusted God. And as I say that, I make a big point about the, the kind of the craziness of the errand that Jesus sends them on. Because it strikes me that they just go and do it. And the truth is, sometimes you and I, as we are called to offer hands of obedience to praise our God, there's a lot of times... For sure in our world, but even among God's people where we do protest. We do push back and we don't obey when God says to do something. Our world says it all the time. Who is God? Who's Jesus that we should listen to him? Who is God that, that we should listen to his word and what he says and the direction that he gives us? There's all kinds of pushback when, when people look at it and they go, well, I know God says we shouldn't live together before we're married, but everybody else is, and what's the big deal, and we're consenting. When God says something and we don't immediately obey, there's a problem. And when God asks us to do it, the truth is it's not new. Our whole lives God has said, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to obey. And we've had opportunity to process it and see it and test it out and know the truth and the wisdom of what God asks us to do. And still so often, as God's people, we question. And that obedience comes slower than it was. And what he asks isn't so crazy. It's pretty easy. And yet still somehow we struggle, even though we know it's God's will to worship him and be in his house, to do it. Even though we know it's God's will to serve one another and think of others and help each other, we are slow to do it. These hands of praise that obey God, the way they offer their praise and obedience. We see it in another way. It's up on the, the screen for us as we continue with this story in verse 7. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. 
The disciples took their cloaks off and made some kind of a saddle, a way for Jesus to not sit on this, this dirty little donkey. And so they took their cloaks off and they put it on the donkey for Jesus to sit on. And then we're told many of the people spread their cloaks on the road. Imagine, this isn't too hard to do, it's a week away. Imagine it's Easter Sunday. And you've got your best outfit on. Maybe you even bought a new Easter dress or a new Easter tie or something like that. And so you've got, right, you're excited. You want to look your best because this is the high holy day in the, in the church year. And you come to church and, and you're all decked out and you're feeling really good. Would, would you take that garment and, and throw it down out in, out in the parking lot? in a puddle so that no one had to walk through that water? Would you do that? I, I would certainly second guess it. My wife just bought me a, a suit jacket, not for Lent, but I had it for Lent, and I really like it. And, and I'll be honest with you, if I was wearing that jacket, I'd be like, I'm not sure if I want to throw it on the, on the ground so that the donkey's hooves wouldn't get dirty, because that's what they're doing. And then you think about it, these people, they don't have the kind of clothes and resources that you and I have. I think about how many jackets I have. I've got a fall jacket. I've got a couple winter jackets. I've got a spring jacket. I've got jackets to wear, so I can wear them with shorts to the beach if it's a little windy. Right? We've got all kinds of stuff. You think about the clothes that you have. These people are wearing what they have, many of them. And they threw it down. They offered it freely in service to Jesus. And the wealth that we've been given, so different than them, and yet so often for us, we hold on a little tighter. And I know that this day is a little different day. It, it, on Palm Sunday, it is a day where there is an excitement and a sort of this, this crowd and, and flurry of things going on, and maybe they don't all get it, but they're just doing what everybody's doing. We don't know what's in the hearts of each one of them, but they did it. And sometimes when we just take a step back and we go, would I do it? Or how do I do that? We recognize that there's some faultiness in our thinking. Too many of us think of our resources as our resources and not on loan from God. We throw something in the offering plate as we come in and check in for Lord's Supper today and, and some of us think, ah, well, you're welcome, Jesus, like we did him a favor in using his money and resources and giving it back to him. We have a funny way of thinking about our lives. We have a funny way of thinking about our obedience as though somehow we've done God a favor when it's what we owe him. Because Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. But you see, not only hands of obedience, hands that praise God through their lives, and so do we. I, I don't want to get down on us and, and say, hey, you don't give enough. Hey, you don't serve enough. But if we're honest, we don't. It, it is okay for us to recognize that we praise God through our lives. And honestly, let's hope that we do. Because if the only praise that we give God is here in worship, it's not enough. One hour a week for us is not what Jesus deserves. He deserves our whole lives. And so we really should look at our whole lives. Every moment of our day is a way and an opportunity for our hands to be busy in obedience so that our whole lives are offering praise to God. We've had a good year in our offerings, and I don't want to pick at you for it. We, we've had a good year. And yet when you look at, there's a couple different like norms that the Synod uses to encourage congregations in their congregation mission offerings. If you use either one of them, we are way less than half 
of that encouragement. We live in a district, we serve in a district at St. John, St. James within our Senate of the Wells. We serve in a district that is one of the biggest, one of the oldest, supposedly most mature, and has one of the lowest per communicant giving in our entire nation. There is room for improvement. And it doesn't mean that the praise we've offered isn't good or isn't God-pleasing. It simply reminds us that there is room for improvement. We're in this world. We are sinners. And our praise is not perfect. And their praise was through their lives and also through their lips, much like us. Let's listen to what their lips say as they take that palm frond in their hand and wave it in worship and praise to Jesus, a sign of victory, a sign that they believed that Jesus was their king. And we're not exactly sure what was in their hearts, as we said before, with mob mentality and people getting excited. But these are the words that the crowd says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And with each of these phrases, these people were Hebrews. They knew the Hebrew language. They knew that literally the word Hosanna means save us. They would have known the Old Testament much better than we do because we have the New Testament and we typically know that better than the Old Testament. They would have known these words are messianic. They were about the promised Savior that God had had said would come, the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the one who comes on God's behalf, God's errand, God's servant to save God's people, the one who would come from his father David, from that line, the Messiah that would be the suffering servant to save us from our sins. And so there was Hosanna, there was praise in the highest heaven because heaven itself cared about what was going on with Jesus coming into Nazareth because this was a heavenly goal and a heavenly kingdom and heavenly things were happening. That's what these words mean. Some of them knew that. Some of them perhaps not. Some of you knew what those words meant. Perhaps some did not. We could compare and contrast who knew what and, and how and those things. And in the end, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you and I see with 2020 vision and look back and understand with clarity what these words really mean. That you and I who, who offer an imperfect praise, because we're not just praising an earthly king, we are praising our heavenly king when we praise Jesus. When you and I praise God and lift our hands lift our, and offer our lives in praise to him and our lips in praise to him, what we understand is we are praising him for being our Savior, our Savior from sin, from our faults, from our lowly praise, from our obedience that sometimes isn't what it should be, from our offerings that could improve, from thoughts of head and heart, that sometimes are lackluster in what they should be or sometimes just lacking completely. And so we praise Jesus because we know who he is. It's not just an exciting Sunday. It's an exciting Savior. A Savior who would go and march on and have the crowds turn on him and stop crying Hosanna and blessed is he and instead crucify. Hateful words screamed at him. People beating him and mocking him and slapping him. A beautiful savior that would, would save us and pay the price for our sins. And this is why we praise. This is what we see and what we know and what makes our hearts soar and sing. And so we use our lips to praise our God, 
to rejoice in who he is and what he's done because we with the eyes of faith know we don't know what was in the hearts of that crowd some may have believed many would have understood those words but we don't know but we can examine our hearts and let our hearts be filled with praise let our hearts be filled with joy let them soar and sing as we see Jesus in his passion march to that cross to be our Savior. And let us exalt him. Let us exalt him through our lives and through our lips. Our praise, using our hands, won't be perfect. It'll be purple and white some of it imperfect, some of it lowly and not what it should be. But let it come from our hearts that want to praise our God. Let us rejoice and exalt him for who he is and what he's done. Let us continue to walk with Jesus in his passion and use our hands through lives and lips, hearts raised and hands raised to praise our God. Amen. Would you please stand? And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. In response to the word, we'll join together in singing the Create in Me. encourage you to remain standing as we go to our God in prayer. Please join me in your hearts. Lord Jesus, you are the King of heaven and earth. We join the first Palm Sunday worshipers in praising and glorifying you for coming to this earth to be our Savior. Though you are one with God the Father and Lord of all, you humbled yourself and became one with us. Thanks be to you for living a life of perfect conformity to God's holy law in our place. Praise be to you for being obedient to death, even death on a cross, to redeem us from our sin. Cause our voices to blend with those who sang your praises as you rode into Jerusalem. Move us to confess you before others as our Lord. Help us proclaim the message of peace and forgiveness to people of all nations. Use us to assure all people that your blood has cleansed them from sin and set them free from slavery to sin, death, and the devil. Move us to dedicate all we are and have to your glory. Lord Jesus, you are king over all the earth. Bless the nations of this world with wise rulers and good government. Let peace prevail. Grant success to the businesses and industries of our land to serve for the common good. Cause all employers to be honest and fair-minded and all employees to be diligent and faithful. Look with favor on our nation's schools. Be with those who teach and those who learn. Comfort the sick and the afflicted with the assurance of your care and protection. Strengthen the faith of the dying. Lord, we remember especially our sister Rebecca Winkle and our brother Al Zemer, both who were in the hospital uh, this past week and now recovering at home. We thank you for the care that they've been given and the, the medical professionals that you use to do your will, Lord. And now we'd ask that you use their medicines and expertise to help restore them, help them to get stronger, help them to be able to use their lives and their lips to bring you honor and glory. But especially, Lord, we ask that you reassure them in their faith, strengthen them, body and soul, Lord. We ask for these blessings in your name, Lord Jesus, as we also ask. As we walk with you this week toward Calvary, keep us focused on your purpose for coming into this world, 
and on our calling to spread this wonderful message of salvation. Hear us for your mercy's sake. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the celebration of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. On the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, he gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. We'll invite the ushers to come forward at this time. If you're receiving Lord's Supper, we'd ask that you put your hand out to let them know that you'd like the elements. And when we all have them, we'll stand and we'll eat and drink together.
I'll invite you to stand. You may remove your masks. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior. It is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be assured your sins are forgiven. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. O oh God the Father, so, so, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you've given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We'll remain standing as we close with our final hymn.
You may be seated. A couple of announcements for us. Uh, today uh, is our last Sunday that we'll be um, having Sunday school and adult Bible study in between services. <clears throat> As you think that through, that means that Melissa Valeski, Jill Kyle, and Nikki Kiso uh, have been teaching pretty much every Sunday. We've had Sunday school since the beginning of the year. And so for, if you are one of those parents or children that are um, appreciating their teaching, if you want to give them a thank you, what a great day to be able to do that and, and just share with them your appreciation for their faithfulness throughout this last year. So thank you to Melissa, Jill, and Nikki for their hard work this year. Um, in this next week, you know this is Holy Week, the beginning of Holy Week, and so we're going to continue to look at hands of the passion. Our focus will start to change um, from the hands of the people around Jesus to the hands of Jesus himself in these next um, services. And so we'll continue that, that series, but we'll look more so at and focus on Jesus as we do that. Uh, and so Monday, Thursday, 6.30 service, Good Friday, two services, uh, one at 3 o'clock, one at 6.30. The 6.30 service will be a service, a tenebrae service it's called, a service of darkness. Uh, and so it's, um, it's really quite dramatic and a little bit emotional. Um, and so I'll encourage you to think about uh, attending that. I love the, I love the service of darkness. Uh, so um, that might not be your thing. 315, 630, those two services. Easter Sunday, we've got the song service scheduled at 6 and 730. Then 9 and 10, 4, uh, 1015 are our festival service. Um, much like today, where we needed a little bit of patience uh, as we all found our places to sit, we're probably going to need that with some of these services, right? Uh, and so just reminding you all that we just need a little patience and um, we'll take the time that we need to get everyone settled and feel comfortable and be able to worship with us however many come for all of those services um, finally um, martin luther college has prepared and has set up uh, a bunch of different musical offerings from their students as well as devotions from some of their pastors and professors there on campus they're making them available to everyone in the senate and so i've asked uh, Amanda in our school office if she would just post those and make a link for any of you that want them on our Facebook page you can go directly um, to MLC and you can find it and get it directly in your email box but if you want to if you just check Facebook once a day you can find that link if you'd like just something else to kind of bring your uh, draw yourself a little closer to Jesus and his walk this week with those devotions so just letting you know about that resource as well God be with you in the coming week hopefully we'll see you a lot this week God be with you till then. Thank you.